Well, hello, Horizons Church. Thanks for inviting us into your homes today. Would you join us in worship as we open this service? Here in your light we find what makes us come alive, a sacrifice of praise. A city on the hill, surrender to your will, your glory on display. Your glory on display. Oh 
Hello, I'm Fred Guidi, executive pastor here at Lost Creek and campus pastor in Grafton. I wanted to take a moment today and pray with you before we get started. Father God, we just thank you of being a God of love and mercy. Lord, we thank you that you're a God that knows the beginning from the end. Lord, as we are in these uncertain times, Lord, we thank you for being with us, Lord, and offering us your mercy, Lord, your wisdom, and your guidance. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. Lord, for those that aren't well, Lord, we just ask that you bring healing. Lord, for those that are in uncertain times, Lord, we just ask that you bring a calmness of their spirit and peace. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that as we go forth today, and we project your love and mercy into this world, that you fill us with faith, Lord, you fill us with wisdom, and you fill us with guidance. And in the holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we ask all things. Amen. My friends, I bring you Quint Pitts, lead pastor, Horizons Church. Hey, Horizons Church, love you guys, miss you a lot. Uh, It looks like we're going to be doing this weird church for another uh, 30 days or so. And I just want to invite you to now be a part of what we do every weekend at Horizons, which is our offering. Uh, The tithes and offerings that we give to God are how we do ministry here at the church. And if you haven't noticed, I'm sure if you're paying attention, you have noticed, we're still doing ministry here, uh, despite the COVID-19 crisis. We're still feeding hungry families out of our food pantry. We're still feeding hungry kids with our backpack program in Taylor and and Upshur County. We're still feeding and clothing and sheltering the the kids and orphans and widows in Cambodia. We're still doing uh, online church services. Oh, by the way, this is Holy Week. If you maybe you haven't remembered that, but this is Holy Week coming up. And I'm going to be online every day of Holy Week. We're going to track Jesus through his week, okay? Uh, just real sh- short little devotionals every single day of the week uh, at our Facebook Live. Um, We're also going to be doing a wonderful Good Friday service on Friday, and we're going to have a wonderful Easter weekend like we always do at Horizons. That's our Super Bowl, okay? So none of that happens, none of that happens without your generous giving. So thank you for giving. Here's the way to do it. You can text to give with the number on the screen. All you do is put the dollar sign in front of the amount you want to give. Also, you can give on our website at horizonschurch.net, or you can do it the old-fashioned way, and you can mail in uh, a check uh, we've, uh, we've had wonderful response. People continue to give, and we're able to keep doing what we're doing because of you. Thank you for doing that. And now here's Pastor Steve. He's our teaching pastor with today's message. In the spring of 1996, I stepped out of the pastorate to put my personal life back together and to try to, uh, try to repair my marriage. But, you know, leaving, leaving the pastorate put our family in a financial bind. Uh, Good jobs were hard to find, so I started a business, and I discovered the hard way that most new businesses really don't uh, become profitable for the first, well, three or four years of their existence. Um, That's a general rule, and our business was no exception to that rule. So um, most of the money that I made from that business went right back into the business to keep it afloat, and that meant that every month that we had to draw some money out of, our, uh, out of a little bank account we had uh, to cover our family expenses. Um, that was going on week to week, and we saw that, uh, that bank account shrinking. So we, she shifted gears, and we went into an austerity mode. And we didn't, we didn't uh, for nearly two years, we didn't buy anything or repair anything that wasn't absolutely essential. We didn't even go to McDonald's to, uh, to, for a night out. But I really wasn't, I don't think I was that worried. I, I, I was really sure that the business was going to take off soon, and then, you know, we'd make good money and we'd be flush again. But no matter how much time, how much effort, how many hours I put into the business, I just couldn't seem to make enough money to cover our basic expenses and our bare-bones lifestyle. And then a couple of years into our struggle, my son wanted to get married. Our friends all came around. They all chipped in. They helped us with, with food and, and with decorations. But, you know, even a simple wedding isn't cheap. And so that little stash of money that was in the bank that we used to help us keep up with our monthly bills, that little stash got smaller and smaller as the wedding day got closer and closer. 
until one Saturday morning, I pulled up into the Huntington Bank drive through and withdrew the last bit of money that we had to our name in order to cover the final costs of that wedding. When I pushed the button and I, uh, and I sent the withdrawal slip up through that vacuum tube to the lady over there behind the, the glass, you know, I, I knew that the circumstances in my life were about to change. You know, we'd, we'd been in a financial struggle for a couple of years, but we were about to enter a time of financial crisis. Every month from that day forward, the monthly expenses were going to exceed our monthly income. And I had no idea how we were going to come up with the extra money that we're going to need to, to avert financial disaster. Our credit was tapped out and our money was gone. As I sat there waiting for the teller to finish the transaction, the reality of what was looming right there in front of us, it kind of rushed over me like a wave. And I remember turning to Jody in the car and saying, you know, I didn't think it would come to this. I didn't think it would come to this. By that, I meant I, I didn't think God would ever let our financial situation get this desperate. I always thought that God would bless the business and we'd start making money well before our reserves ran out. But I was wrong. I knew what it was like to live on a tight budget. I mean, we lived on a tight budget for 20 years. I knew what it was like to do without. You know, Jody and I never had a lot of stuff. But I never started a month knowing that God would have to do some pretty amazing things if we're going to have enough money to pay our bills at the end of the month. I'd, I'd never stared into the future and, and felt that vulnerable. I, I'd never stared into the future and, and been face to face with the reality that I could... I could lose everything. From that day forward, the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, uh, it had a whole new meaning. Before that day in the drive through bank, uh, at the, at the drive through at the bank, life was, life was challenging. But after that day, I could, I could feel my life kind of closing in on me. I mean, it literally, I felt like I was being pushed into a tighter and tighter and tighter place with fewer and fewer and fewer choices. That day in the bank drive through was a critical moment for me. Because uh, for the next two years of my life, I had to get up every day and I had to decide. I had to decide whether I was going to lean into God and I was going to let this unexpected hardship in my life refine me and make me a better Christian, a better father, a better husband or whether I was going to clench my fist and become angry with God and let this hardship I was going through really harden me and turn my soul to stone. And one of the things that God used in this critical time in my life to, uh, to keep me in a good place was the habit of praising God in the middle of the mess. I don't know if you figured this out yet, but your heart... Your heart is a storyteller and a song singer. And if you don't give your heart a story to tell that's true and a song to sing that praises God, then your heart will write its own stories and will sing its own tunes. And when you're going through unexpected hardship, the natural tendency of your heart is to write fiction and to tell lies, to sing those lies out. You know, I, I can tell you that because my heart wrote a whole book. It was entitled, I Deserve Better Than This. My heart belted out a blockbuster song that it wrote, said, God, if you love me, you wouldn't treat me this way. But fortunately, in the middle of those dark days, God led me to Psalm 66. And as I read that psalm, and, and the more I read it, and the better I understood it, the more I realized that I had to give my heart a new story to tell, and a new song to sing. Ultimately, Psalm 66 became one of my favorite psalms. And maybe, just maybe as I share some insights from that psalm today, it'll become one of your favorites too. You know, we don't know who wrote Psalm 66, but we know that the guy that wrote it was going through a very difficult time in his life. And yet, and yet this man opens up his psalm with an anthem of praise. If you only read the first, what, seven verses of, of Psalm 66, you'd never know that the author of this psalm was going through any trial, any trouble. So why does this man, who's up to his eyeballs in trouble, 
Why does he spend the first one third of his psalm praising God and telling stories about God's faithfulness to his people rather than, than complaining to God and accusing God of mistreating him? Why does he do that? Well, I think the, the writer of this psalm opens with an anthem of praise because he understands the human heart. You see, your heart, your heart can't help but tell you stories. Your heart can't help but sing songs. God made your heart to do just that. It's how your heart shapes your belief. It's how your heart fuels your emotions. You can't stop your heart from telling stories and singing songs. But you can decide, you can decide what kind of stories your heart will tell, and you can decide what kind of songs your heart will sing. And that's why the writer of Psalm 66 opens with an anthem of praise based on two great stories from the Old Testament. I think it's always, I think it's always important to give our heart a story to tell that reminds us that God is faithful and a song to sing that draws us closer to him. I think that's always important. But when we're going through unexpected hardship, it's not just important. It's, it's absolutely critical. Because when you, look at the, when you look at the past and you remember God's faithfulness to you and to his people in the past, and then you praise him for it, it actually literally changes how you see the hardships that are looming right there in front of you. And that brings us to this life principle. Praising God in his faithfulness, praising God for his faithfulness in the past changes how I see my hardships in the present. When I praise God for his faithfulness in the past, it changes how I see my hardships right now in the present. Psalm 66 opens with these words. He says, Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glories of his name. Make his praise glorious. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in, in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. He passed through, they passed through the water on foot. Come, let's rejoice in him. When the author of this psalm has one of the most difficult and uncertain times of his life looming right there in front of him, what does he do? Well, he stops looking at the problems right in front of him, and he focuses his heart back on two great stories in the Bible in which God showed up to help his people when their backs were against the wall. And then for seven verses, this psalmist praises God, not for exempting his people from hardship, but for faithfully helping them through their hard times. Then in verse five, the author invites his own heart and your heart and mind to come and join him. He says, come and see what God has done. How awesome his works are in the behalf of man. And then he begins to recount two stories. He recounts how God split the Red Sea from Moses and saved the children of Israel from the Egyptians. And then he remembers how God rolled back the Jordan for Joshua so that the Israelites could walk into the promised land on dry land and possess it. But why is this man telling these stories from the Bible and singing about the faithfulness of God when he's in the middle of a mess? Because he knows, he knows, he knows that his heart is going to tell a story and his heart is going to sing a song about what is happening right now in his life. He can't stop that from happening, but he can give his heart a story to tell that is true. And he can give his heart a song to sing that celebrates the faithfulness of God because he knows if he doesn't, his heart will look at the problems that are looming right in front of him and it will sing lies and it will write fiction. That's why we open today's uh, worship service with two songs of praise. That's why we come to you every week with new truths from God's Word. Because our hearts will never tell us the truth if all we're looking at is the trouble right in front of us. It will not. If all we feed our heart is the latest data, about the coronavirus, the, the current death toll, the, the, the latest principles or guidelines for social distancing, the state of our economy. If that is all we look at, then our heart will, will write a tragedy and it will sing a dirge. If our heart is ever going to tell us the truth, then when, if it's ever going to tell us the truth, when we're in the middle of a mess, 
We have to give our hearts stories to tell that are true and songs to sing that reminds us that there is a God who rules forever by his power. And there is a God whose eyes watch over us even when we're in the middle of a mess. And so as we go through this corona mess that we're in right now, it's really important. It's super important for us to remember God's faithfulness and to praise him on a daily basis as we ask him for his help. But when we're going through a period of unexpected hardship, I can tell you that God's goals for us is not just. It's not just to deliver us from a mess. He also wants to take what Satan intends for evil. He wants to turn that on his head and he wants to use it for good in your life and mine. This whole COVID-19 thing that we're going through right now has probably turned your life upside down. It's turned mine upside down. And if if I ask you today, what, what do you want God to do right now? What do you want him to do? I think most of us would say, I just... I just want my life to return to normal. I'd like like to get back the way my life was before this whole mess started. But I can tell you that God has a higher goal for you than that. If God answered that prayer, then you would come out of this corona, corona crisis, the same person you went into it a few weeks ago. And I can assure you God wants more for you than that. God wants to turn the hardships that you're going through on their head. And he wants to use them for good in your life. God wants to use your hardships, the hardships that you're going through, to refine you like silver so that you come out of this corona crisis a better Christian, a better father, a better mother, a better daughter, a better friend. Better than you went into it. We're going to see how God did that in the the life of the author of Psalm 66 in just a minute. But before we do, I just want to take a minute and remind us that often before God, before God can change our circumstances up on the mountain, he has to change us down in the valley. Because God is not just the God of the mountain. He is the God of the mountain. But he's also the God of the valley. And so our worship team is going to remind us of that as they lead us in a song called Highland. Sunrise to where 
President Trump um, warned us on Tuesday that the next the next three weeks could be pretty tough for us as a nation. As uh, as we see the virus spread, we see death tolls rise, and we see bank accounts shrink. Six out of ten Americans were told are worried that they're not going to be able to pay their bills in April, and if they can't pay them in April, what about May? What about June? Over the next thirty days, sixty days. You may very well turn to your husband or to your wife and you may say, gosh, I didn't think it would ever come to this. You know, two weeks of social distancing is, yeah, it's brought some families closer together, but it's pushed others further apart. 
But then this week we found out that we're going to be cooped up together in our homes for, gosh, another 30 days. You know, when my wife got that news, uh, she posted this thing on Facebook, this little, uh, this little, this little conversation on Facebook between two women. And uh, the first woman talks, comes to her friend and says, hey, where's your husband? And she replies, well, he's in the garden. And her friend says, well, I didn't see him. And the woman says, oh, we have to dig a little bit. So if I come up missing in the, uh, in the next 30 days, you'll, at least you'll know where to look, right? So, uh, you know, we need a good laugh as we go through tough times. But the reality is being cooped up together for six weeks, it just isn't easy. Living in financial uncertainty, it's not easy. Teaching our kids at, in our home isn't easy. Trying to find toilet paper and, and baking flour when people are hoarding them isn't easy. But here's the reality. When life isn't easy, when life isn't easy, our character flaws come to the surface. That's what happens. When our life isn't easy, our character flaws are revealed. They come right up to the surface of our life. And it may just be that God is allowing you to go through some hard things right now so that he can refine you like silver. And he can make you a better Christian, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better child, a better boss, a better, a better worker, a better friend. Because here's what I can tell you. There are lots of things that God wants to give you. There are a lot of blessings that God wants to pour out in your life, but he can't, he can't put those things in your hands until your soul has been refined. And that brings us to this next life principle. God allows hard things in my life to refine my soul. Not just to refine my soul, but also so he can bring, so that I can handle the good things he wants to give me. God allows these hard things in my life to refine my soul so I can handle, I can handle the good things that God wants to give me. Now in verse 8, the psalmist continues to praise God. He says, praise our God, O peoples, let the sound of his praise be heard. And then the mood of this psalm goes into kind of a dark place. And the author begins to explain all the trouble that's going on in his life. As you read this psalm, you, it suddenly dawns on you that this man is praising God because God has turned this time of hardship and a time of trouble in his life into a time of growth and personal refinement as a, as a believer. He says, For you, O God, tested us, you refined us like silver. You brought us into prison. He uses a picture of a bird being caught in a net. He says, you laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. You went through, we went through fire and water. All those things were happening. All those hardships were taking place. And he says, but, but you brought us into a place of, of abundance. You brought us, we were in a tight place, and you brought us into a wide place filled with good things. You know, when, a, when metal workers in the ancient world refined gold or silver, they melted that precious metal with intense heat. They used intense heat to, to melt it down because that intense heat would bring the impurities of those precious metals right up to the, to the surface of that uh, of that molten metal. And when the impurities rose to the surface, the refiner then could see them and he would, he would skim them off with a ladle and, and discard them. And he would, he would repeat that process again and again and again, skimming off more and more and more impurities until he could see the reflection of his own face in the molten metal in front of him. And when he could see his own face in the, in the silver, he knew the silver was refined and his work was finished. When God refines us, something very similar happens. He allows just enough hardship, just enough trouble to enter into our lives to bring our sins and our character flaws and our pride right up to the surface. And he brings them right up to the surface so we have a chance to remove them, to skim them off and get them out of our life. If we cooperate with God's refining work, <clears throat> he, will, he will skim those character flaws. He will skim those, those uh, life-controlling sins, those, those secret places of pride in our life. He will just skim them right off of our life until he can see a reflection of, a reflection of himself in us. In verses uh, 10 to 12, the psalmist tells us, 
what the refining fire looked like for his life. He says that God allowed him to be trapped like a bird in a net where he didn't have choices. He said God caused him to carry, he made him carry heavy burdens that just seemed like they were going to, they were just too much for him to carry. He said he allowed his, the armies to knock him down in the battle and ride over him with their horses and chariots. He said God made him walk through fire and swim through floods. He was pushed into this tighter and tighter and tighter place with fewer and fewer choices. But rather than becoming angry and shaking his fist at God, he cooperated. He cooperated with God's refining work. And then one day, one day all of that hardship and all that pressure brought him into a wide place, a place of abundance, a place where God could give him the good things that he'd always wanted to give, wanted to give him, but he couldn't because he couldn't handle them until now. Now that God had changed a piece of his soul. You see, this man didn't just go through hardship. He didn't just suffer. He allowed God to use the hardships in his life to bring his sins and his character flaws right up to the surface so he could see them. And he could give them to God and God could just skim them off and his soul could be refined. And as a result, what Satan intended for evil, well, God used it for good. God used the hardships and the suffering in this man's life to refine him, to make him a better believer, a better man, a better father, a better friend. And when his life and his soul had been refined, God brought him out of that tight, hard place into a wide, abundant place because now, now he was the kind of man that could handle the very things that God wanted to bless him with, that God wanted to put into his hands. What is a diamond? Isn't it just a piece of coal that's been changed by intense pressure? Isn't that all it is? What's a blessed Christian? Isn't he just a sinful man who's been refined by hardship and pressure so that God can, can make him the kind of man? So he becomes the kind of man that, that God can bless, that can handle the good things that God wants to give to him. Isn't that what a blessed Christian is? But here's the question we got to answer. What does it mean for us to cooperate with God's refining work? What is God asking us to do so that we come through this, this crisis that we're in changed, refined, and then blessed? Well, the end of Psalm 66 answers that question. We're going to unpack that in just a minute. But to prepare our hearts for what God's going to say to us, the worship team is going to lead us in another song. It's called Graves to Gardens. I search the world, but it couldn't fill. empty praise treasures that fade are never enough you came along put me back together every desire is now satisfied here in your
You know, one of the unexpected gifts that the, uh, this corona crisis can give to us is that God can use the hardships that this virus brings into our life to refine our souls and make us better believers, the kind of believers that can handle the good gifts that what God wants to give us. But for that to happen, we have to respond to unexpected hardship in an unexpected way. We have to cooperate with God's refining work and be, and be changed, ref, ref, just refined by the hardships rather than hardened by them. And that brings us to this, this final life principle. How I respond to hardship determines whether my soul is refined by the experience or hardened by it. It's, I don't get to determine whether I go through the hardship. I get to determine how I respond to it. And how I respond to the hardships in my life are going to determine whether my soul is refined by those experiences or whether my soul is hardened and turned to stone by those experiences. You know, on February 20th, 1962, John Glenn strapped himself into Friendship 7 and became the first American astronaut to really orbit the Earth. And, uh, but to get back home from that, from that historic flight, John Glenn had to trust the people that were on the ground, NASA, who were guiding his flight, and he had to fire some rockets on his, and that were in his, his space capsule. He had to fire those rockets when and where the people on the ground told him to fire them. If he fired those rockets when and where NASA told him to, then that capsule would stop orbiting the Earth, and it would turn, and it would, it would, it would streak towards home at a place where people were waiting for him. To pick him up. But if John Glenn ignored NASA's instructions and he fired those rockets when and where he darn well felt like it, just when it felt right to him, then his capsule would in fact stop orbiting the Earth. But that capsule would be shot out into space and he'd be lost forever. So when you or I, when you and I are in the middle of a mess, those hardships that we're going through. They're going to they're gonna bring the sins and the character flaws of our life right up to the surface of our life. And maybe for the first time in all of our life, we're going to see them absolutely clearly. That's a gift. That's a rare moment. But it's also a critical moment because what you do next, what you do next with that insight is, gonna, is going to determine whether you're going to come out of this time of crisis, a better believer who is streaking towards home, towards God, or whether this crisis is going to leave you unchanged or in a worse condition, and you're going to find yourself spinning further and further away from your Creator. The author of this psalm decided to cooperate with God and let God do His refining work in him. And as a result, he emerged from that crisis 
and says this, Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what God, what God has done for my soul. He has come through this hardship. He's come through this difficulty. He's come through this time of refinement, a different man. And he says, come and listen, all who fear God. And let me tell you, let me just tell you what God's done for my soul. And then he begins to tell us what he did, what he decided to do, how he decided to respond so that his soul was refined through this experience. He says, I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened, and he has heard my voice in prayer. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you, vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. You see, when Jody and I left that bank drive through in 1998, and we started each month not knowing how we're going to keep up, you know, how we're going to keep, what we, if or how we're going to keep our house, how we're going to pay for our car, how we're going to take care of our family, how we're going to put groceries on the table, how we're going to pay our utilities, how we're going to take care of our kids. We came through that uh, with a lot of uncertainty. So we did what the psalmist did. We prostrated ourselves before God and we asked for his help. But as in all we did, we got up every day and we praised God, whether we felt like it or not. We praised him in the middle of the mess. We went to church every week. We continued to tithe on whatever money we had. We found ways to serve God, even though we didn't have much time. We, we owned our sin, gave it to God and confessed it and, and vowed that we would change certain things in our life. And then we gave ourselves to God and begin to make those changes. And I can tell you that month after month, month after month, God always gave us a way to pay our bills. Sometimes opportunity to make some extra money came out of the blue. I didn't know where it was coming. It was just suddenly there. Sometimes we were fed by ravens. Sometimes Jody and I would look at each other and, and look in the rearview mirror and say, I don't know how we got through that month, but we did. Those months and those years did a refining work in my life. They changed me on a very deep level. And I can tell you, I can say with the psalmist, come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you. What God has done for my soul. He changed me through that. Those are some of the hardest days in my life. But they changed me. They refined my soul. They gave me a different future. I don't think I, don't think I would be a pastor today if I hadn't gone through those hardships and cooperated with God's refining work. I just don't think I would have. And so if you want to come through these difficult days that you're in right now, if you want to come through them refined, you want to come through them changed. You want to come out to a wide place where God can bless you and give you the good things that he always wants to give you. If you want that for your life, then you got to do what the psalmist did. Cry out to God for help. That's the easy part. But don't stop there. Get up each day and praise God in the middle of your mess. Praise God in the middle of the hardship. Let go of your darling sins. You can't, God can't change your life. If you hold on to your sins, God can't change your life. He says, if I held on to my sins, God wouldn't hear my prayers. But he did, because I let go of them. The goal is not to see how many sins we can come out the other side of this with. The goal is to let God change us. Make some vows to God and tell him how you're going to change your life, how you want your life to be different, and then dedicate yourself to God and dedicate yourself to the will of God and begin to make it so. The psalmist said that he went to the temple and he made burnt offerings. That is, he, a burnt offering was an offering that was completely consumed by fire. It was a picture of that person saying to God, here's my life, and I want to totally give myself to you and to your will. And I, co I commit myself to you and to your will, whether it's easy or whether it's hard. These simple steps help this man 
the man who wrote this psalm, this helped him cooperate with the refining work of God in his life. And they brought him into this wide place, this abundant place where God could give him the good things that he always had wanted to give him, but couldn't until now. These steps, these simple principles worked for him. I could tell you they worked for me and for Jody, and they will work in your life too. If you weave them into your life while you're going through the mess. Psalm 66 is just 20 verses long. But the author of this psalm again and again and again reminds us that we need to praise God when we're going through difficult times. This psalm begins and it ends with praise because praise is such a big part of how God refines our souls as we're going through hardship. So to help us to be a people who praise God in the middle of the mess, we've created a playlist of some of the favorite songs that we have, praise and worship songs, and we put them on a, uh, on, on a Spotify playlist. And we've, and, uh, we've created a Facebook, a, a post on Facebook, where you can post some of your favorite praise and worship songs. And uh, we can look at those songs. We pull some of those songs off and add them to the, pl- to the playlist. Now, you can find that Spotify playlist on our, on our website at horizonschurch.net. And you, can, you can share some of your favorite worship songs on our Facebook page. But Psalm 66 begins and it ends with praise. Therefore, it's only fitting that our worship time today that began with praise should also end with praise. And so here's our worship team. They're going to lead us in a final worship song called Do It Again. And my prayer for you is that will jumpstart a life-changing process in your life as we go through this crisis. God bless you. God loves you. And we're going to make it through this with a powerful God.
I know there's probably people watching today who have not yet crossed the line to become a Christian, and I just want to give you an opportunity to do that. It's very simple. It's not an easy thing to become a Christian. It's not an easy life to be a Christian necessarily, but it is a simple thing to do. It's as simple as ABC. A, I need to admit that I'm a sinner. I think everybody watching today can certainly admit that they're a sinner. And if you're in doubt about that, just ask somebody that's around you. Ask your spouse, ask your coworker. They'll tell you that you are a sinner. Uh, the problem with being a sinner is there's a debt to that. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And because all of us are sinners by nature and we're sinners by choice, uh, we are doomed to die. Uh, but B is believe. Believe that Jesus Christ died in my place. That's what he was doing on the cross. When he died on the cross, he wasn't a victim. He wasn't uh, a martyr. He was laying down his life. He was willingly sacrificing himself so that you and I could have our sin debt paid off. So yes, the wages of sin is death, but I need to believe that Jesus paid that penalty. And then C is confess. I need to confess Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. And you can do that right there where you are. Uh, you don't have to come to church to do that. You don't have to phone in. You don't have to have a priest, pastor, rabbi, or anybody else around you to do that. You can just simply talk to God and say, hey, I believe I'm a sinner and I admit it. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. And if you do that, let me know that you did it. All right. I've got a little booklet I'll send to you. It's free. It doesn't cost a penny. I'll mail it to you. Uh, just fill out the connection card uh, that is uh, nearby. Uh, it's, it's somewhere around your video screen. Uh, you'll be able to find it and just click on that, fill it out, Make sure you indicate that you, today you received Jesus as Savior, and I'll send that to you in the mail. God bless you. Have a great week. Hey, Horizons Church. Thanks again for joining us today. We love you. And uh, as we go out today, I would like to just do the numbers six blessing and just say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We'll see you next week.